I always have way too many slides and uh, I don't cover enough basic material. Uh, so you should, uh, I'll try to pause actually, you know, and ask for questions and you should definitely interrupt. And it, 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 it is going to cover the, the topics and I think I sent even papers uh, some months ago to hand out. Um, maybe more briefly than I, than I should, but uh, uh, I thought I'd, I'd start with, uh, I looked at the program and I, I was actually at a conference last night uh, uh, with drug delivery, which is a part of my lab because part, part of the lab is, uh, the, the, the broader vision of the lab is, um, uh, is, is really polymer science, as you'll see, and uh, with, with a major thrust in, in bio. We're all polymers, right? The, 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 the major um, classes of, of molecules, the proteins, the lipids, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, these are all polymers, right? And, uh, and so we make use of polymers, and I'll start with sort of a, something of an application of polymers uh, in, um, in, in drug delivery. And, and uh, if you can see, okay, uh, there's, there's, both red, there's both red filaments here and, and green ones, and, and we're going to be talking about our, our phytomycels. And it's kind of 10 or 15 slides on using these things um, that are very long, like, can be very long, uh, high aspect ratio, like uh, F-actin, the cytoskeletal polymer. You've, you've had lectures on cytoskeleton and flexibility of cytoskeleton, so, so if you can kind of see these red filaments, they have a persistence length, you know, on the micron scale. We're able to, to make self-assemblies that I'll tell you about that are softer and, and stiffer than, than these things and, and use these in delivery. But as, as I say, it's part of a broad, the broader effort in the lab of using soft, soft materials, polymers, um, in, a, in a context of, of delivery, as you'll see, but, but, but also in, um, in under, better, better understanding cells and, and, and even development, as, as I'll try to argue. And so on this, this movie here, we've got a, uh, cells migrating on one of these polymer gels, maybe you've heard about in the past, uh, that's so soft that we don't, we don't need to add much more to these cultures to sort of see, I, I hope you can, that, that these cells generate enough force to, to, distort, to distort the matrix, right? So in particular, watch this cell migrate by and, and this, this, this matrix is, uh, is uh, being pu uh, pulled and distorted, right, and springing back. And, um, you know, so you, you, want, you want control over the, of the microenvironment in order to, uh, over the, the polymers, in order to, uh, to visualize these things and understand and put it in context, all right? So, so as you say, the, the, the broader vision of the lab, we have uh, all sorts of chemists and, and some biochemists, cell biologists in the lab, as well as engineers of various sorts and physicists. And, uh, and if you sort of had to categorize, you know, what, what's, the, what's the broader science? It's really a polymer science approach to, 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 a, to a, number of, a number of topics. And, and so um, sort of the fount of all knowledge, Wikipedia, you know, tells us that the history of polymer science goes back <coughs> Uh, you know, 180 so years ago, um, but at, at, the, at the time, uh, it, it really started as, as as biochemistry and and synthetic chemistry modifications of biochemistry. So I'm trying to say polymer science that we're so familiar with, with you know, so many things around us today, uh, are are polymer synthetic polymers really started in biology too, biochemistry, right? You're taking molecules out of out of uh, living systems, uh, modifying them, making use of them. It actually took another 90 years w w with uh, the, you know, that initial start. It's taking from biology, modifying it, making something useful to understand that a polymer was really a series of, of monomers covalently linked together. So this is a guy, Staudinger, uh, is credited with that. And, and he was really the first Nobel Prize in the early 50s, Nobel Prize in chemistry, for really describing polymers as, as they really are. All right, so we have biochemistry giving rise to chemistry, and, and in the, for various reasons, uh, wars and things like in, in the 30s and 40s, uh, is, uh, it, it was quickly realized, you know, we needed to better understand the, the physics of, of these systems, the, the mechanics especially, and all the other physical properties as these uh, 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 biochem synthetic modified biomolecules or, or pure synthetic polymers, you know, started uh, generating interesting materials. Well, what kind of materials and properties do you want? Classic engineering, you know. And so to, to, to engineer, you have to characterize and theorize about it. And, and so uh, one has a, a, a transition from, you know, the, 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 the making stuff to, to uh, characterizing and understanding it. And that's mechanics and statistical mechanics. And the Nobel Prizes start reflecting that. So Paul Flory, well, 20 years after the first chemistry 
uh, uh, Staudinger uh, Chemistry Prize was, uh, was given the Nobel Prize really for co uh, contributions to theoretical polymer chemistry, statistical physics uh, of polymers, and, uh, and another um, 20 years later, uh, another theory prize to, to a guy named Dijen, who worked in this aspect and many other aspects of, of uh, statistical physics, right? Um, so, uh, you know. As I said, yeah, polymers are, are are pervasive, right? And 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 I, but I have to say that they're they're underutilized across this, you know, from from point of view of of uh, of looking at biology as as a bunch of polymers, and that's maybe one of the message that uh, messages I'll, I'll try to convey here, and 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 that uh, uh, means um, both uh, characterizing them and and also theorizing about these things. All right. So as I said, the first ten or fifteen slides are really on on on. Uh, a, a delivery aspect, uh, and and it's inspired by nature's delivery systems, right? When typically thinks of um, viruses, I don't know as delivery systems, but really they are used quite frequently today to, to deliver genes into cells, uh, and, and and typically the viruses that are used are sort of shaped like this, just kind of round, right? And you know you're familiar with all sorts of pictures like this. What you may not be so familiar with um, is is that those viruses that are filamentous in shape. So these are viruses that infect plants, like tobacco mosaic virus, but also viruses that infect us. Uh, many forms of influenza, this is H5N1, which I think was in the news, it's been in the news for the last few years, and many forms of influenza are uh, predominantly filamentous. And we asked the question, let me, let me say, as I, I said before, that the, the, the uh, actin filaments have a persistence length, you know, have a, a rigidity to them, uh, of microns, even though they're nanometers in diameter, and these viruses do too. And uh, we asked the question, does the shape matter for, for delivery in a general context? And our approach was a polymer approach, right, as I was setting this up, right? So we've been working with block copolymers, things that have hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts for uh, a, a number of years already when we started asking this question, uh, and, uh, which is six or seven years ago. And, and we learned in simulation as well as an experiment, and I'll show you very quickly, that um, that one can self-assemble a hydrophilic hydrophobic polymer, right, uh, in, in simulation and computation as well as experimentally into a very long rod-like shape, really the movies that I showed you in the first slide, right? And they're, they're, they're molecular, bimolecular in, in cross-section, but, but many microns long and have a, have a lot of robustness to them, all right? So, so uh, these are some of the latest polymers. They're actually fairly simple, po very simple polymers, a lot of, a lot of people uh, here do these these kinds of polymerizations of um, uh, uh, polyesters, uh, ring 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 opening polymerizations. This is polylactic acid. This is polycaprolactone. These are used for suture materials, all sorts of biomedical materials. And we're we're using um, uh, a peg. This is a very common in shampoos and all sorts of commercial products as a, what's called a macro initiator to grow a polymer of peg and these these two hydrophobic. Now these have a lot of hydrocarbons, so these are tending to be more hydrophobic than this. Uh, uh, more oxygen-rich polymer. So this is the hydrophilic part. This is the hydrophobic part. This is, this is the hydrophobic part of polycaprolactone. It doesn't really matter so much for this talk. This is when we copolymerize in polylactic acid. And, and these are, again, some I images of worms. Um, in this case, we don't have uh, polylactic acid. And this thing is rigid, and this is flexible. And you can study all the persistence length and all the physical chemistry. This is all, all fun. You can image it. And, and then you can start beginning to, to control it and apply it. So here we see these things flowing through a, a, a nanoporous agarose gel. And so that molecular cross-section allows them to sort of track through the porosity of this material as we, as we have a convective flow. Uh, right now it's filled with dyes. I'll get to you know, filling this with drug. And it has some advantages over making polymers that uh, assemble into 100 nanometer objects, things, things we call vesicles, right? All right, so, so we thought, you know, we, and we did all sorts of experiments under the microscope and the characterization of the, the chemistry and the physical chemistry, and then said, okay, time to start applying the biology. Uh, these things under the microscope with, with cells bounce around, you know, on Brownian motion. They're not sticking to the cell. So we said, oh, well, that's good. So we'll, we'll inject these into, the, into mice uh, and rats and uh, into the tail vein here. And the surprise was that these circulate a very long time. Uh, most nanoparticles are cleared, and this is a couple examples of that, um, within a day or two. Uh, and they're actually cleared by, uh, let, me, let me describe the fluidics. I know you had a talk in microfluidics, and I ran across a number that I do have to double check, but I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate it. So, so it's, it's claim, the number that I heard yesterday at this conference was that your brain is actually 
filled with, with, with blood vessels, right, sort of emulating, you know, the, that, that, that um, in, in total length are 600 kilometers, right? Uh, numbers I'd heard in the past for your whole body would be six, uh, more like 100, 100 miles, right? But, um, you know, you've got many, many uh, miles, whether it's 60 or 600 kilometers of, of blood vessels coursing through you, right? There's a real microfluidic system in you. I mean, the blood vessels, the smallest capillaries are a couple microns in diameter. Uh, so these worm mice cells, phylo mice cells, are, are uh, maybe 10 microns long and really being stretched out under these, these, these tubes in you, you and I. They're pumped by your heart, obviously, right? But with such a, with such an extensive microfluidic system, it's not hard to imagine things get gummed up, right? And to prevent that from happening in you and I, we have filters. We have spleen and liver and a few other maybe parts of organs that, that help clear things from the circulation. So. Things that get cleared in a day or two, most nanoparticles, viruses, bacteria included, uh, maybe, maybe even faster, get cleared by the liver and the spleen right, in a day or two. The surprise with these things is that they, they eventually got cleared by the liver and the spleen, but they would circulate up to, up to about a week. And I can go into the mechanisms of how, these, how we think physically these things evade uptake by the liver and the spleen. Eventually, they do get taken up. By, the, the, long, the, the uh, longer circulating objects here are about, the, in length, the diameter of a, of a blood cell. So we have flexibility, we have length, we have uh, uh, migration through flow, and, and, and as our paper, papers started coming out in this, uh, we noticed uh, 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 another example of biomimicry, not from, from viruses, but uh, there, there are filaments floating around, it, circulating, I should say, not floating, everything is uh, reasonably high uh, convection in UI. Uh, but uh, these, are, these are filaments that are circulating in new light, at least briefly, and these are uh, proplatelets that are generated in the bone marrow from megakaryocytes. So, so these are these are professional platelet-making cells, but they make filamentous objects. These proplatelets, as I'm alluding, and these fragment under shear in, in, into platelets. And um, you know that this was a science paper from five years ago, and uh, they 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 somehow have to learn how to spell shear, right? It's S H E E R, but um, but. This is, uh, you know, this is this is actually the sort of thing that happens with our worm mice cells as well. In fact, we as we as we uh, pull blood out of the, the rats and mice, we find that our 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 mice our filamentous objects are getting shorter and shorter with time. Nonetheless, they persist in the circulation, but they're getting shorter. So this is a very very similar sort of shear fragmentation uh, of platelets in this case, or our, our mice cells. And and to to understand some of the some of the requirements for, for long circulation. We played with our polymer science here, our chemistry, and, and we compared non-cross-linkable that are highly flexible. This is just reverse fluorescence. Highly flexible over a, a few seconds. This uh, uh, configuration looks totally different from that. Circulates for days. But if we cross-link, this is just vinyl polymerization. This occurs in car tire rubber uh, but within this nano, nano object. And we can lock in. Uh, rigid, it becomes rigid, locking a conformation. Some are straight, some are epsilon shaped, you know, some are all sorts of other crazy f shapes, and all of those get cleared within hours, maybe even minutes, right? They're, they're also, though, not fragmentable. They're, they're rigid and, and not fragmentable, so we have to disentangle that a little bit better. So, so what I've, I've told you is that we've, we've developed a, a filamentous polymer assembly that, that um, uh, delays by, by factors of five and ten the clearance by your professional filters, your liver and your spleen from the circulation. And we thought, okay, for application, maybe we can load this with drug and, and deliver more drug to a tumor, right? Okay, so we've done the simulations of how our polymer self-assembles into this object together with a drug and, and loaded drug, this anti-cancer drug called Taxol. All right, so we have an anti-cancer drug. We inject in the, in the tail vein of a, of, a, of a mouse here that has a, a very visible tumor on the back. And at the same dose of, of drug, these, these three conditions here, uh, we measure the amount of cell death in that tumor and also the tumor size after, in this case, a week. And I can tell you all the kinetics. Usually the, we, this, this tumor is growing exponentially beautifully. When we inject at the most effective doses, we really shrink and stably shrink, in, and again, in exponential decay, this, uh, this, uh, this tumor. And, and, and the, the, the carrier that's a most effective, well, let me say the free drug at the same dose uh, free drug is completely ineffective. The tumor size is the same. There's no measurable uh, change in cell death. But if we go to an 8 micron versus a 1 micron long filament, um, the 8 micron long filament uh, gives us 15-fold uh, more cell death 
and shrinks the tumor almost to, after a week, almost to the level that it was at the beginning of the week. Moreover, we can load more drug than um, we can possibly inject the, the free drug. You know, and this is really what one wants ultimately in any kind of nanocarrier. You can deliver more drug uh, to, to a tumor site and shrink the tumor and kill more cancer cells, and that's, that's what we're able to achieve, right? But we've had to really engineer the polymers here to be, you know, these systems to assemble, of course, to take up drug, of course, but also to be flexible, I think fragmentable as well, um, and, and control the length. Like, like these proplatelets, perhaps, like phylo, phy, filamentous viruses, perhaps. All right. That was a model tumor. I'm going to begin segueing towards, uh, towards, towards these notions of microenvironments and control of microenvironments around cells in, this, in the la next few slides. So, so we're going to go from model tumors in the flank to brain tumors. All right. Uh, so so the, he, he, again, we're going to use, I didn't mention, but uh, human cells grafted into, into the mouse. But in this case, it's the mouse brain. We call this an orthotopic tumor. And, and we build insight into, into tumor growth and some of the aspects of development and, as they say, segue into these, uh, these microenvironment issues. All right, so these cells um, in a dish and in the flank, in the back of the mouse, um, are susceptible to, to, to our drug carriers, just like I showed you before. These are somewhat different. These are glioblastoma cells, I should have emphasized. These are cells, de de they're human, as I said. They're derived from someone decades ago that had a brain tumor, and, and these cells have been propagated and used in research ever since. All right, so in culture, we can add free drug, this red curve, and, and, and the number of cells that are viable with, uh, at, at low dose of drug is high, and, and as we add drug, we kill more cells. Our carrier also does the same, maybe, maybe slightly better. Uh, the polymer isn't very toxic. We have to go to a very high dose of polymer to, to cause cell death. If we inject, if we, if we uh, look at the tumors growing in the back, they, they have this exponential phase, and then they sort of plateau off, right? There's a lot of noise up here, but they, they, the trend is to plateau off. Um, if we add our, our carrier system, um, we really suppress that growth. That's great. That's like I showed you. We can shrink these tumors. Um, in the brain, however, here's the exponential phase. And you know a hint of plateauing off, um, and and our drug carrier is not very effective. Yeah, statistically, it's not very, it's really insignificantly different. Slightly lower, but uh, not very promising. I mean, we were, actually we anticipated this, and you'll get to the I'll get to the punchline soon. So uh, so we have uh, tumor growth to understand a little bit, and also ineffectiveness of a, of a carrier. All right. So let, let's the, the curves that I showed you these sigmoidal S-shaped curves are, are, are really fit to the classic model, goes, goes back 100 and some years, logistic growth, where one has initially exponential growth, but then um, death by crowding, so to speak, competition, pressure in a general sense, or maybe a very mechanical sense, right? And that's, that's where we, we'll start you know, uh, alluding to the me mechanical environment. So the second term is what really gives you the plateau phase. The solution to this differential equation you know, worked out many, many decades ago, is this S shape, right? And it looks like this. The, the exponential ultimately would, would come up top and give you the, the, the initial growth phase. And when you fit the data, in the flank, these, these tumors are, are growing. Um, just pay attention to the minus. This is where we don't add drug. That's the important one. Don't add drug uh, in, the, in, the, in the back of the mouse. They grow at 2.8, the doubling time, you know, double in size is 2.8 days. In the brain, it's 2.9 days. It's the same. All right? If we add drug, the plus sign here, to the flank, it's more than 40 days to, to double in size. So it's, it's effectively suppressed in growth. And the, 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 uh, the fitting of our data with the uh, tre drug treatment in the, the brain tumor is, is maybe slightly, slightly delayed. Okay? So the, the growth is basically the same in the two sites. It's the first clue that actually these tumors are pretty similar. They, the fundamentally, the, the initial exponential phase growth of the cells in the brain and the flank is, is the same, all right, a few days. The maximum size, the plateau phase, though, is, is, is much different, much more different, right? It's, uh, it, it, it grows from effectively one at the beginning to, to 40 times that size uh, in the flank, in the, in, the, in the flank of the mouse. But, but um, three times, so 120x, three, three times larger in the brain. Well, why is that? Anyone have a clue? Why might that be? Right? They're growing at the same rate, but crowding and or pressure. The brain is softer. Hmm. Who said that? All right. Okay. 
So that's, that's where we're headed, right? Growth rate appears independent of tumor site. Crowding is less severe in soft brain than stiff flank, right? So that's what I'm going to build on, the, the microenvironment constraints. The drug carrier is ineffective against the brain tumor, even though, you know, in that first phase of growth, uh, where the t drug is very effective, can be very effective. In the first phase of growth, there's no difference, right? All right, so compared to brain, flank tumors are stiffer, indeed, uh, and collagenous, collagenous. There's a lot of collagen there. The most abundant polymer in you and I, you talk about polymer science view of biology, the most abundant polymer in you and I is collagen, collagen one, all right? So we're going we're gonna to go through some of the, some of the matrix composition of these, of these tissues. So we use micropipettes. Uh, we pulled out isolated flank tumors. In fact, brain tumors were so soft, we, it was very hard to do. I'll show you some, some data related to that. But we could pull out a flank tumor and measure the, the, the rigidity. Aspir pulling an aspiration, there's a prefactor in this, and, and, and the aspiration length um, for a given pressure, and this is this is uh, the equilibrium time, the equilibration time required t time versus um, distortion into the pipette it was used to measure uh, a rigidity, a so softness of this tumor of a couple kilopascal, so one and a half, two kilopascal. This is this is a very soft gel, gel-like material. N nonetheless, it's it is stiffer than brain, uh, and I'll give you numbers for, for that: it's, it's five to ten fold than the brain tumor. All right, and collagenase, well, if we add an enzyme called collagenase that breaks up this major protein in you and I, then we soften it, in this case, by, by two-thirds or so, right? And we can do it in 10-minute in, in, in treatments of enzymes. So this is very rapid. It's, uh, isolate, measure, treat, and in 10 minutes, cells are still viable would be the point, right? This is not uh, de degradation of the tissue. We can, we can rapidly soften this. Uh, so how do I know there's collagen there? And the classic way to do that is to, is to use, use antibodies, maybe some other ways as well. The more modern way, New Millennium, is uh, literally that, uh, is enabled by the genome, is to use mass spectrometry. And over the last few years, as we've gotten into stem cells and development and now cancer, um, we, we've, we've uh, strived to develop method, methodologies to characterize the composition of our tissues, right, from that polymer science chemistry point of view, you know, what is there? Um, in, in a high throughput way, right? So the genome has, has 25,000 genes, right? You have all these proteins and isoforms and spliceforms and modifications. Yeah, there's a lot of co complexity and composition to understand. Uh, and, and the modern way to do it, uh, and an algorithm that we've developed, and I'll give you the reference next, uh, is, a, is a quantitative label-free approach um, to, to characterizing at least the most abundant proteins from a, and it makes sense from a polymerist point of view, what's the most abundant proteins in your sample? All right, so mass spectrometry is you know, a tool that's come from physics uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. And, uh, and, and using a, a series of mass spectrometers to, to, to measure uh, polymer mass, mass to charge ratios is not a new idea. Uh, what you do is, in the biological implementation, is, is take a tissue or cell lysate, you can do it with this, a pretty small sample, it's remarkable. Uh, fragmented, in this case we don't use collagenase, an enzyme that degrades collagen, but trypsin that is an enzyme that degrades all proteins. And it cleaves it into sort of known, um, at new, known sites. It, it breaks the, the proteins into known uh, fragments. There's a separation on a column, a high performance liquid chromatography column that separates the peptides. And then this peptide is actually with uh, tens of thousands of other peptides, maybe hundreds of thousands, is, is run through a mass spectrometer and then there's, there's two steps of segregation and you get spectra for mass over charge that uh, can be compared to what I, what I mentioned, the genome basically. We know where this enzyme cuts and others have worked this out, beautiful work, and I'm sure there's a Nobel Prize in this as well coming. Actually, there already is one on, on mass spectrometry. Uh, but knowing the genome sequence, one can actually predict what the protein sequence, of course, what the pro protein degradation products are, and match theoretically from the gene, knowing the genome, which is, you know, just in hand for the last decade, what the peptides are, and, and, and score and rank, and, and this is now pervasive, all right? But um, it's more than just identification. What we had to work out was an algorithm, it just came out last year, for how to quantify this, how to quantify these proteins, all right? So, so you get many fragments from many proteins, and I know this is way too busy, uh, but um, but for, for, a given, for a given polymer, protein, you'll get 10, 20, 50, 50 peptides. 
And what you want to do is find out, well, let me say it this way, weed out less reliable peptides, peptides that didn't fragment so, you know, all the time from all the protein, right? And, um, and maybe one protein has a, a, a variant A and, and also a variant B, and so you have slight differences coming from variants. So these are exceptions, and we, we, pull the, we generate scatter plots to, to identify the best correlated peptides within a sample, both from the same protein and compared to different proteins. And so for uh, hundreds of proteins that we're able to, to, to quantify, uh, we might be uh, quantifying based on, I don't know, five, 10, at least two, often five to 10 peptides per protein, maybe even more. Then we, we, we say, well, Sam, say the, the brain tumor, for example, as I'll show you, is different from the, the flank tumor with respect to protein A by, by tenfold. All right, so then we'd follow through with an antibody. And to some extent, that was done in this, in this paper last year. Here it is in this, in this context. So we've got the flank tumor and the brain tumor. And we have actually the, cell, the cells here in the dish, right? And, and remember, I told you these are human cells, right? So we put human cells in the mouse. And we have the mouse genome, and we have the human genome. So it just took a little bit more computation on our part to sort of say, this is material polymer protein coming from the mouse, and this is protein coming from the human, right? So I just, I, we have a big long list of mouse proteins, I'll just tell you that uh, the, within, the, within the, the, the mouse segment of the flank, collagen 1A1, the most abundant protein in this animal, is 21-fold um, is higher than it is in the brain, all right? And in the brain tumor, all right? Close the door. Sorry, is it? Uh... And, uh... And, and the mouse brain, so, so the, the brain tumor is on one side, usually, as you saw. There's normal brain on the other. So we take the, the, other, the other side of the brain and do the mass spec. And the, and the, the mouse brain has even less, less collagen. Uh, so, so 0.07 if we call one the, the, the brain tumor site. So, so this brain, uh, 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 the, the brain tumor is remodeling, right, in a matrix sense. And you can, we put a number on it. It's more than tenfold more collagen in that. That's true for collagen one. That's true for collagen six. These were the most abundant mouse collagens and then we have, of course, longer lists. Generally, there's much more matrix in the mouse brain than in the normal brain coming from the mouse, and much more matrix protein in the flank tumor uh, than, in the, than in the mouse brain tumor. Now, we could also quantify the human proteins, right? And, and I alluded to this. The flank, to the flank tumor is, is one and a half, two kilopascal. The brain is left, half a kilopascal. It hard, it's more viscoelastic, and I'll come to some measurements on that. So the human protein was also quantified. And, and kind of the same story I just told you for mouse protein. The, 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 uh, the, uh, these, these are the, we did, detected almost 200 proteins, human proteins, specific proteins. And only five of them were different between the flank and the brain by more than twofold. All right, so these, these, are, these are cells that I told you came from a, a brain tumor, a uh, human brain tumor. And, um, and they're secreting uh, matrix related matrix and matrix related proteins. So they, they're not like fibroblasts. They don't secrete a lot of collagen one, and we don't detect it. They do detect. They do express. It seems collagen fourteen. We we quantify uh, seven uh, peptides out of nineteen that we detect, um, and uh, of course that's a matrix protein. Then there's tenase C. This is another. We uh, quantify thirteen out of twenty three detected. Right, so we've got a, we've got a lot of information on these on these matrix proteins, and then there's matrix-related proteins and something called the TGF beta path. Maybe you heard about this pathway, uh, and this other one, which also is matrix-related. Four out of the five here in green, and the list goes on to 200, nearly 200. Um, these are the, these are the five that, that uh, four of the five are matrix-related. The fifth, I'll comment in a second, and these are the five that change by more than twofold, and these are all lower. These are all lower in the brain than in the flank, all right? So the matrix secreted by the, by the human cells in the brain is sort of recognizing, someone said soft, I, I gave you the measurement, right? Is recognizing a soft microenvironment and secreting less or recognizing stiff and secreting more, right, in, in, in the flank. That propagates into the cell, it seems. GFAP, GFAP, glial uh, fibrillar, fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP, is an intermediate filament protein. Anyone know any other intermediate filament proteins? You, you heard, you know, through the last week and a half about actin, actin cytoskeleton, maybe intermediate filament proteins discussed at all. So intermediate filament proteins in your, in your skin are 
or if you hair, horns, nails, keratin. Keratin, right? So, so at least if you think of you know, your nails or you know, a rhino horn, you know, it's, it's, it's a structural protein. And you have intermediate filament proteins uh, also in cells include GFAP and many others. In fact, there's intermediate filament proteins even in your nucleus. And, and they're, they're, they're mentioned here. They're usually these intermediate filament proteins in the, nu in the nucleus, the B-type lamins, I have to stress, we, which we detect, uh, are, are relatively constant. And in fact, that's what the numbers over here say. So in the brain, in the flank, in the dish, these, the, the, the intermediate filament proteins B-type in, in the nucleus don't change much. But the GFAP inside the cytoplasm uh, is 50% uh, is lower in the brain than in the flank. So the cell is, well, let me say, predictably softer. We didn't actually measure that. But you, this is one of the major structural proteins uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in glial cells. And in fact, it's a marker. It's often said to be a marker for glial cells. And I just told you it's derived from brain. But it's actually lower in a brain tumor than in the flank. right? So the microenvironment is influencing matrix secretion, but also intermediate filament protein expression. All right, so, I, so brain and flank differ by just 5%. All right, I didn't tell you yet, but the dish, if you compare the protein profile of cells in the dish to either of these, which only differ by 5% in two-fold different pro proteins, 40% of the proteins. This is massively different, almost 10-fold different phenotype at the protein expression, expression level, uh, cells growing conventional plastic dish. All right, but cells in the dish and cells in the flank, those are killed by Taxol, by the drug. Right? Cells in the brain, they're not killed. All right. So, so some of you, maybe all of you had guessed what, you know, in fact, what we had anticipated as well, that uh, despite all this information I told you, you know, really the problem you have to deal with here is we need to penetrate a blood-brain barrier. Right? So this is, this is a blow up of a, a mouse brain where we've put in our fluorescent uh, infrared uh, uh, phylomycels, our carriers, and, and they're, they're in the vasculature. You see that nicely. And we could show you the same if this brain had a tumor. The problem is that the stuff that's in the bloodstream doesn't leak into the brain, even if there's a tumor there. So our drug carrier is not getting into the brain, right? So the people who came to us with this, uh, with this, um, this, this, this problem to work on, they were radiation oncologists. They, they knew they had the answer. They had radiation therapy in their back pocket, and they said, look, we're going to focus a radiation beam, and, and we had some, they had some preliminary evidence that this would enhance leakiness, and the only question was whether it would enhance leakiness enough for our carriers to get in. And in fact, that's what they show. And, and we go on to show uh, in our latest experiments that we get at least two thirds of the mice are long term survivors when you combine drug therapy with radiation therapy, right? So, kind of simple polymer systems, well engineered, controlled, combined with uh, what, what most people get, the, you know, unfortunately, if you have cancer, you know, radiation therapy. And you can do, if you, if you have the right carrier combined with radiation therapy, you can get, uh, you can uh, impact brain tumors better than uh, just radiation therapy alone, better than chemotherapy alone as well. All right, so I, you know, I, 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 as I said, this was more of a segue into this issue of microenvironment, right? So, so brain, brain is indeed soft, and, and I've already given you some numbers. We talked a bit about it. You know, in the word of, so, words of, of someone that is, is putting their hands on brains all the time, a brain surgeon, you can go online, I'm sure, and get the, uh, take a look at this uh, documentary. This is a guy that travels from the UK to Ukraine for a number of years and, 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 and is, is, uh, is uh, well, he's telling stories about his trips there. And, and, well, in his words, normal brain has the consistency of very smooth cream cheese, even smoother, I guess, than Philadelphia cream cheese, right, where I'm from, right? And in fact, as he said, and I gave you kind of the numbers, the tumor is more rubbery, ru rubbery stickier, and thicker, right? This is, this, is, this is words of a brain surgeon, right? It's like, what's the Pascal or something, right? That's, that's not how brain surgeons think, right? Kilopat, not, you know, these are, this is the description, at least for a documentary. All right. So, so here's, here's some, some measurements of, of that, but in a development context, all right? So how do, how do, you, how do things develop? A, a brain tumor that becomes stickier and thicker. And, let me put that in an embryo context, all right? And, 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 and uh, this is, uh, I, I sh actually should have shown the, the chick embryo picture here, but anyways, this is starting from um, an embryonic disc of a chick, and, uh, and then we have the, the, the embryo and the heart developed and the brain developed. And day by day, we're using our micropipette to measure how stiff and soft this is. And then we'll do proteomics and some other things, as I'll show you. All right, so, so the brain is, I allude to a viscoelastic. As we aspirate, it, it, um, 
it doesn't really come back so well. So it's got a major viscous component, irreversible component to it. The heart, though, very quickly actually, and I'll say, say this, show this clear, you know, builds up cytoskeletal, builds up matrix, things, and, and becomes more and more um, stiff, and, and also is, is always relatively reversible uh, elastic. Uh, this is the, 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 the starting point here, day zero, as I said, the embryonic disc. We measure both the heart tube, the heart, as well as the brain. There's a lot of noise here. As I say, we're not really happy with our brain measurements. So, so it's, it's soft. It's less than a kilopascal. All right, we can also do the collagenase treatment of the, of the, uh, of the heart here. And 40% of the stiffness measured here at day four is, is because of collagen, at least in that sort of measurement that I showed you before as well. And then if you inhibit the myosin-2, so have you talked about myosin-2 in, in, yeah? So myosin-2 walks along actin, but, but uh, forms in the filament. You'll have a lot more from me, right? And this generates force, and it contributes to the mechanics, the stiffness of tissue. In the case of heart, even at day four, it contributes roughly a third, not quite as much as the matrix, but the cell is generating, like, tensing up its muscle, and that's contributing stiffness, right? You're, you, you know, you're relaxed, it's soft, you tense up. And, and uh, a third of the heart muscle is, uh, is, is uh, stiffness is due to that. In fact, what I just showed you is just part of the, part of the spectrum of, of a, a, a development, in development, of normal adult tissue uh, stiffness. At, at, at a micro scale, most of these tissues have been measured, although more, more needs to be done. So, so brain, as I said, is less than a kilopascal. We've got a big window there, and others have done better measurements, and we need to clean up this, this figure some. But, but brain is very soft. Heart. Skeletal strided muscle, uh, heart muscle is, is at least tenfold stiffer on this kilopascal, 10 kilopascal, 15, some, some will debate 20, maybe higher. Um, then we fat is soft tissue, right? Then we have uh, other tissues in between, uh, some of them mentioned here. Uh, and, uh, and then there's, there's, there's uh, cartilage and bone. Well, of course, bone at a macro scale is rigid, calcified, but what we put on this scale um, for reasons you'll see with stem cells, is really precalcified bone and microcartilage. There's a, around the cells in bone, around the cells in cartilage, is is a matrix layer, and and the stiffness or soft the softness of that layer uh, is distinct from the stiffness of the surrounding calcified bone or the surrounding cartilage. So on this scale, there were dozens of kilopascal. Right, a lot of cell biology is done growing cells on rigid plastic, although cells secrete things on that. So plastic is off scale in terms of rigidity, right, as, as, uh, as, is, as is calcified bone. All right, so the plot down here is more of this mass spectrometry business, right, where we took all these, these were adult mouse tissues, and I'll eventually get to, uh, to, to comparisons to, to human, and they compare very well. This, this, this kind of scale has been done with, with mouse, uh, to some extent, um, and chicken. I showed you, actually, the chick embryo, uh, and, uh, and uh, with, with some human tissue as well. Uh, so by mass spectrometry, one sees sort of what was alluded to before, and over, over um, several orders of magnitude, that from brain to, um, to, to, to heart here to uh, the bone, uh, collagen uh, increases systematically. In fact, this power law, this scaling, typical in poly polymer physics, and um, you know, you'll see another example of this soon enough, right, where the elasticity is set by the, 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 the polymer itself with and without cross-linking, maybe other additional components. And, and, uh, and here, the collagen one concentration relates to the elasticity, or vice versa, to nearly the one, first one, you know, one power, but it's, it's really one and a half. So you could say elasticity is collagen to the two-thirds power from inverting this rela relationship here across several orders of magnitude in collagen and a couple orders of magnitude in tissue, tissue stiffness, right? So how do we, you know, so what? So how do, we, how do we make sense? So I, you know, had the first slide of cells migrating on soft gels, right? And so the, the gels that we make were really uh, initiated in this sort of context uh, by, by Yuli Wang, a seminal paper 15 years ago, polyacrylamide immobilized on glass, functionalized with collagen 1. But in this case, it's a ligand and is not st structural. I, we know that from doing AFM on the surface of these gels. This collagen is currently integrated, interpenetrating, but doesn't, doesn't affect the elasticity. So the red and green points are here with and without collagen. So we're controlling the elasticity through this polyacrylamide polymer gel. It's a hydrogel. It's 90, 95% water. 
And more recently, or the last, last number of years, we, we've done, made similar gels immobilized on glass with hyaluronic acid. This is a naturally derived anionic gel. We can polymerize it and cross-link it, functionalize it with collagen. And, and I have a slide or two later that says you get the exact same thing with respect to cell responses that I'll show you when you control the elasticity of either of these gel systems. Okay, so, yeah, please. Right here, exactly. Okay, so so you 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 cross link them. You come in with AFM and you indent, force indentation. You use something called the Hertz model or related to to extract out an elastic constant. All right. So the elastic constant now is the force to indent and the indentation distance. The three three halves power. We have an elastic modulus now as a function of what you were asking, the cross linker. So we add cross linker to at various concentrations. This this is over a tenfold range, to three, five, ten percent polyacrylamide, which is ninety to ninety-seven percent water. All right, and and a small amount of cross linker is is hooking the chains together. Right. So this is one acrylamide chain, polyacrylamide chain. This is another floating around. We add the cross linker, and when these diffuse together, covalently they're they're locked together forever. It's a covalent bond. Can't be broken very easily at all, especially by cells pulling on it. It doesn't degrade, all right? And, uh, and as I add more cross-linkers, right, put more cross-linkers together, what, what's going to happen? It's going to stiffen up, right? And Paul, Paul Flory, among others, this Nobel laureate, told us that, that the cross-linker concentrate, the, the elasticity, the rigidity, the, elastic, the stiffness of this, it scales linearly with the cross-linker, all right? That, that was a theory coming about 70, 80 years ago. And, uh, and that's what you see with microscale measurements, all our data points here, the squares, and, and even some macroscale measurements, the circles here, uh, really show the, the, the elasticity is, is linear in, in cross-linker. This is always a good sign to say, you know, we, have, we understand what's going on with the polymer physics, right? Uh, and this isn't affected, as I said before, whether we, when we put collagen in it. Now, I've seen others work in this field, and they don't show this relationship, and I'm always troubled what, they, what their material is, right? Yeah, yeah. So homogeneous and, and isotropic, right? And you can check this by by macroscale t tension tests uh, as as well. It's hard to do by AFM and re rheometry, but um, you know by other other means you can you can see that this is an isotropic material. And, and is there any as well as homogeneous on the on the surface? And we're probing by AFM the surface that we're going to put cells on, right? Go ahead. Is there any Yeah, th these are always, these are good, you know, polymer preparation questions. And so this poly polymerization will usually be done, if I understand our current methods, um, in, in, in a saline solution that the cells, that is equivalent to what the cells will, um, will, will live in, will, will, will be cultured in. So we don't make this in water, pure water, and then, and then change to a saline solution or change solvents like that because gels will swell and shrink and maybe even detach off the surface. Okay? Any other? Please. Yeah. Does the stiffness saturate when you add more So the bottom, the bottom plot shows this kind of thing, all right? That, uh, so this is the hyaluronic acid gel. This is, say, naturally derived, synthetically modified. Um, to give us cross-linking, and here's that linear cross-linker regime as we add cross-linker, uh, but then it plateaus, saturates as you say. In fact, it goes, it go, dangling excess we call it, so this is sort of a, right, you, you, you have a, you have a, you have a cross-linker, it's, it's actually got to react on, 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 on my two hands, right? And if I add, if you, you know, if you add a ton of cross-linker so it, it binds to this side and then binds to this side, then I, then it doesn't bind together, right? So, so then you can not only saturate, we have a, a softer system, right? Than what you should have at lower at lower constant, right? Right. Okay. So, so what one really wants to control these, you know, to under, better understand by control the the, the environment that you're going to grow the cells in. And uh, all right, this is the movie, I, the picture I should have shown you before, right? But I'm going to show you now taking cells from this chick heart. They gave you some idea of the mechanics of fresh chick hearts, you know, stiffen with time. We're going to isolate cardiomyocytes from that. We're going to take uh, embryonic uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and put these on these gels and understand, try to understand what the response is to the elasticity, right? So this is good reductionist biology. 
Well, so you know, so we claim, right? All right. So, so, so I have to, I have to, I do have to tell you that the, the heart tube starts beating as this movie was showing at day three, day four, right? It's, um, it doesn't, it, you know, you, you may have a heart tube earlier, but it, 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 it takes a while. To, we thought these cells were ideal to put on our gels, cells that are spontaneously beating, uh, and and we. I first started wearing this on this a half a dozen years ago. Uh, okay, first paper came out four years ago, and there's more work that I'll show you about unpublished, where these um, cardiomyocytes, these isolated sparse cells, are in this case beating on a soft gel of a kilopascal. These are, these are about day 10 cardiomyocytes, or on a very stiff gel. The stiff gel was, was, was intended to mimic um, a, a gel, a, a, a matrix that's as stiff as a, as a scar, an infarct, right? If you cut yourself and you, you more, more uh, you know, in, through healing, more matrix gets deposited and that scar stiffens up a bit. That happens to your heart if you survive a heart attack. Uh, and then more and more people are. And, uh, and so this infarct region that um, heals with scarring, heavily cross-linked collagen, and we measured by AFM to be in this range, 30 kilopascal to, to higher with, 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 with AFM at the micro scale. So we isolated these cells from day 10 or so embryos, and uh, initially these cells are all beating on all their gels, soft gel, stiff gel, rigid gel, uh, and, uh, and, and then with time, from four hours to 24 hours, the cells on the stiffer gels up to 40, they stop, they stop beating. They, they just can't contract the gel and they, they, they start losing some of their phenotypes. So we look at stain their cytoskeleton, we look at their myosin, their, their assembly, and actinin is one of the cytoskeletal molecules. And on the stiff gels, uh, well let me say on the, on the, on the softer gels, the soft and the, and the sort of, at, at this, the, this, these cells were taken at a time point where the heart is about, about 10 kilopascal. So the, the, those, those cells, they have nice, Strication of the myosin. This is what muscle, you, you know, muscle striation. I think Peter so even commented on the, the striation modulation. You'll hear more about here, uh, being the regular organization of the of the of the of muscle, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, uh, which is lost on the stiff gels. In 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 basically one day on on a gel that's too stiff. Clusters of cardiomyocytes actually show similar similar sorts of loss of loss of function. All right, so, so why is this happening from a mechanical point of view? Well, the cells um, are, are in, in, in either case able to, to beat, but they don't transmit strain into the matrix. So I had these movies, these color-coded movies below the, next to the cells as they were beating. These color-coded movies, um, you had any lectures on traction force microscopy? Yeah, right, so this is the traction force image, right? And so one has high traction strains and low traction strains, I want to say, on stiff, high on soft, and, and low on stiff. And, the, and so the traction strains, you know, this is muscle. Look, I can't, I can't move this building, I can't move this uh, desk, right? I can, I can lift this coffee, but I can only do so much work, right? I can only displace things if they, if they match, if they, they're below my load threshold. So here's that load threshold. This is actually a, a sixth power that goes through this. It's very sharp cutoff. And one can take this data, Square it. This is the matrix strain. This is this green curve is the matrix strain. Uh, square it, multiply it by the modulus. Get this curve, which is the contractile work, the work done on the microenvironment. Right. So there's an optimum. Too soft, and well, the cell strains the matrix, but it doesn't strain it any more than if it gets a little bit stiffer. But then, if the matrix gets too 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 stiff, then the cells can't strain it at all. Right and you multiply a big number times a very, very small number squared, and, and, and you end up with this optimum, right? So, you know, I guess Summer Olympics are coming up soon. Uh, weightlifting in the Summer Olympics, right? Am I right? These guys, when I was growing up, there was this big Russian guy that would, you know, right, they put one kilo more, right? What, what do they do it in increments? Anyone know the increments for the weightlifting? Like one kilo more, you know? Like the, comp the weightlifting, comp everyone knows, right? You know, the weightlifting com competitions, and the guy lifts whatever it is, a thousand kilos. I don't know what it is, right? You know, and then they go to a thousand one kilos, right? And uh, you know, and then it crashes to the floor, right? Hopefully, it doesn't drop it on anyone, right? That that's this that's this strong function here, right? This is just like you. They can't. You can't these are, this is muscle. It just can't do any more work, right? And it just crashes, right? And the consequence is, you know, the work is uh, the, the the work output uh, also crashes, right? 
So is work really required for striation? And so a bit of unpublished work here. You can, you can, you can uh, wipe the, the, the cytoskeleton, ablate the cytoskeleton in a sense. You can add a drug that depolymerizes all the actin. The myosin walks on actin. And so you, you wipe out the actin cytoskeleton, a drug called latrunculin. There's several others you can do. And, uh, and, 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 wipe, wipe, and uh, wipe away the actin cytoskeleton, disassemble it, I should say. Disassemble the actin cytoskeleton in these cells, and then uh, at, it, it, it wash away the drug, it's nicely reversible, and see the striation come back. Or you can do it in the presence of another drug that inhibits myosin, which, which applies the force. So not a drug you want to give to a weight lifter, but a drug that's commonly used in cell culture called blebostatin here. And um, the striation, in the, if, you, if you add in this drug to, to dissolve the actin cytoskeleton called the trunculin, uh, and then wash it away, in four hours the striation comes back. But if you wash it away and, do it, and then add, add in a drug that inhibits the myosin, this drug blebostatin, then the striation doesn't come back. Right? So myosin has to do work, and it, it's, it's, uh, you can go through the details of the drug. It really is only inhibiting the, the ATPase activity of the myosin motor uh, and, it, and the implication. Myosin has to do work in order to assemble the striation, right? And so you have this sort of optimum curve for the mechanics, and on the ones that you can't do work, and so it's not going to generate the striation is the idea, right? So this is the kind of pharmacologic drug data that's uh, in indicative of that, right? So what I just told you is the, the assembly of this, of this uh, filament, you'd have a bunch of these filaments lining up, right, on actin, depends on the ability of this, um, uh, of this myosin to, to do work and generate force on this actin lattice. But the actin is, the cytoskeleton is not just sitting in the cell, it's engaging the matrix outside, right? Just like the weightlifter is engaging the thousand kilogram barbell, right? So we've done some modeling of this together with the, some soft matter colleagues at, at Weizmann Institute, Sam Safran, done a lot of work in all sorts of soft matter things and polymers. And he's got more and more into these biophysics, biophysics of adhesion things. And, uh, and so the modeling of the, the alignment of these myosins from one fiber, one fi filament to, 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 to the next one. So there's actin sort of not shown here. These, these uh, sort of shapes are representing the, the myosin that walks along and generates force along the. So there's tendency in muscle to, to align. This is the highly aligned state. This is the less organized state. And so we work through the theory of this. So there's always two terms. There's that. Uh, a fiber energy, and then an energy having to do with a matrix elasticity. Okay, so this is something of a, an alignment energy and a matrix elasticity energy, uh, uh, with, with uh, parameterized by the density of this alignment. Okay, and, and so the density of the alignment depends ultimately on the matrix elasticity and adding these two terms together and then minimizing, sort of the standard thermodynamic approach, right? You come up with two terms and minimize it, write down, uh, uh, minimize it with respect to the the minimum energy, uh, and find the density that gives you the minimum, minimum energy, and that's the expression for it in terms of matrix elasticity. And the, there's, a, there's a parameter that arises here, this EM star, relates to these other, these other factors in the, in the, in the uh, uh, fiber energies, right? And, and the upshot is that this, uh, this striation here from highly organized to more disorganized um, is, uh, is optimum at this, at this EM, at this, at this parameter. It's predictable, theoretically predictable that the alignment has an optimum. It's not optimum at, at infinite rigidity or something too soft at some intermediate matrix elasticity. One gets maximum uh, 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 um, uh, maximization of this alignment, the striation of the cytoskeleton, right? And if you have maximum alignment of the cytoskeleton, you have also have maximum force generation. Right, so the force generated by, the, by this aligned cytoskeleton, this one here, is higher than the force generated by this collection of disorganized, less aligned uh, uh, filaments, my, actin myosin filaments. And so that expression there, we asked, okay, can we see some semblance of that in real tissue? All right, we, we could show it in a dish. This is now, we go to the earliest day, uh, E3, E4 cardiomyocytes, we look at how the contractions of the cells, the traction forces and strains, and, and so there's the optimum, there's the curve, all right, great, but that's in a dish. We said, can we see this in a tissue? All right, so, so Stephanie in the, in the lab uh, added collagenase to, to, to day three, just these beating heart tubes, and she also added an enzyme called trans that would stiffen. So there are enzymes in you and I that um, will soften our most abundant polymer, 
collagen called collagenase, as I already mentioned. There's also enzymes in you and I that cross-link, right? Like, you know, cross-link this together, and it's not by adding some bis cross-linker, it's by an enzyme coming in and cross and enzymatically executing a covalent reaction. And these are transglutaminases, lysyl oxidases, and there's also glycation. There's a number of reactions, but there's enzymes that, that uh, correlate collagen levels. Here we use transglutaminase because it's commercially cheap. And, and, and the point is, as we stiffen, and we go in with micropipettes, and we measure the stiffness, and we measure the strain in the heart, as far as I can tell, this is one of the first studies done, at least in a development context, where you control the rigidity. This takes 10, 15 minutes I mentioned, we can soften, not to the point of liquefying, but soften and still have a, a substantial elastic tissue that, uh, in this case, or stiffen in this case, and there's the optimum, right? And the optimum, the, the, the peak here, is, is the native tissue elasticity, right? Uh, and, and, and of course the output here is, is how much strain is generated by these cells in an intact tissue if it's too soft, too stiff, or just right, right? We also, this is not projecting very well, we could go in and, and use confocal microscopy you heard about, fix and stain, and try to measure the striation uh, organization. And it, it does fit, uh, at least as we, we really only done the experiments on this side, that uh, the Z disc width, this is the alignment of the myosins, decrease with softening of the tissue, just in 10, 15 minutes, right? So is 10, 15 minutes long or short on a biological time scale? If your heart stops for 10 or 15 minutes, is that a very pleasant thing? That is not a pleasant thing, right? 15 minutes on this time scale, right? this is why we like the system, right? These, especially this chick heart beats at one hertz, right? So this is, you know, engineer, how many cycles is it? 60 times, it's 100,000 cycles, right? Thousands of cycles uh, before the cells start responding, right? But we have a nice clock here, we're not, you know, and, and, and we can do this in, in minutes, and, and of course, you know, therapeutically, you know, medically, 10 minutes is a long time for a heart, right? You know, uh, you don't want to go with that, right? So, so uh, we can say that calcium waves still propagate. Anyways, this is work that's, that's being written up right now. And, and um, this is some, some initial work uh, with the embryonic stem cell drive cardiomyocytes. Are they sensitive to microenvironment? So this is the kind of optimum you see with cells at least for six days on these kind of substrates. So I, I think in the labs you're playing with embryonic stem cells, am I right? Yeah? Are you playing with cardiomyocytes derived from those cells, or no? No? So this is one of the major default lineages. When he, uh, this is a, 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 a mouse embryonic stem cell line that was actually uh, infected to, with, with, a, with a, a promoter that allows only the cardiomyocytes to survive. It doesn't matter. The cardiomyocytes we can work out in, in these same sort of culture systems and as a function of elasticity, the beating uh, rate in this case, in this measurement, is, uh, is showing this kind of optimum with stiffness, right? And, and uh, okay, this is stuff I've already mentioned. So, uh, okay, the reason I go back to this is, so I told you we're going to do mass spec on this, right? So what are the proteins that are, that are following these trends for the mechanics? All right, so we, we grind up the tissues. We can do this very segmentally, as you say. You can do small sections. But um, we knew collagenase sensitivity was there. Uh, but we had no idea what was going on inside the cells. So, so this is, this is a, a log scale here, right? So this is over a hundredfold range. And we had 200 proteins. And we just said, OK, what proteins track these trends? I, I, what, what data tracks these trends, right? And then we asked, what proteins do we find? All right, and the proteins we find are all very sensible in the sense there's cytoskeletal adhesion and also channel proteins that trigger the contraction. So myosin, uh, uh, adhesion, protein, circa, this is channel proteins. So as you upregulate, the matrix also is, go is going up, although the data is messier than we want. We some work to do maybe. But uh, collagen's going up um, in, in heart, not in brain. Um, and all these cytoskeletal proteins that he are going up in heart by you know, an order of magnitude or more and basically constant in, in brain. Um, and, and so just structurally, these cells in the heart are getting bigger, bigger, you know, stronger and stronger as the matrix outside is resisting. And the cells around also contributing to the stiffness, right? All right, so, so I've gone back and forth a bit with heart. Uh, I'm really lousy with time, right? I, we're actually fine. We're okay? All right, so I, I probably have maybe 10 more slides. So. Any, any questions so far on heart? Because I'll transition away from heart. 
Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, you say the soft substrate will actually have a different response compared to a hard substrate for cell. So if you mix the cells with hard and soft, ah. how will it? You should give it my talk. That's what I'm going to do next. Yeah. Okay. And two more, two or three more slides. That's right. Okay. Any other, any other good questions? Uh, bad questions. No, no questions, good or bad. Any questions? Question? No? I think it's okay. All right. All right. So, um, so one of the reasons why we, we, we wanted to work with hyaluronic acid is so that we could do three dimensional cultures that you'll, that you'll see. I actually moved four or five slides. All right. But the, the data here is, is just looking at. Um, the first slide shows you some, some cells called mesenchymal stem cells migrating around. Here we're just looking at morphology. And, um, and so this is just how these cells spread on, on a gel. Just as a simple morphologic measure after a day in culture. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so all of this is sort of control studies that basically says the elasticity that we tune into these gels um, is really what's establishing, in this case, the spreading behavior of these cells. All right. So we get the cross-linking right. We have the right, the right amount of matrix. If you don't have matrix, these cells um, don't, don't, don't spread. They have, to, they have to adhere to a collagen. But once they do, then they start pulling, like those cardiomyocytes, right? They don't beat like cardiomyocytes. They, they, pull, they pull. They say, OK, this is stiffer. I'm going to spread some more. I like it. I'm going to spread, engage more integrins and adhesions, spread more and more until they get sort of some happy limit. And so that's the curve. Uh, here is a function of li how much collagen, but if we, if we work up in this regime where we're not ligand limited, then, uh, then this is the spreading uh, on HA gels or PA, two fundamentally different chemistries unified by mechanics uh, giving you the same response, right? And if you inhibit the myosin with this blebistatin drug, then you see that myosin is part of the spreading response, okay? These, these gels work okay in cultures, even with serum, which is often co complaint. I mean, you can add serum, and, and the, the same response is seen. So this is not uh, these these gels are are clean in that respect. Now there are other materials widely used in these kinds of studies. Not not so widely used by some groups. PDMS, and and PDMS is not a hydrogel. It's an elastomer like a, like a you know a rubber eraser, uh, and uh, it doesn't have water permeating. And it's very sticky for proteins, right? And, and, and not only say difficult to functionalize, but um, it's, it's certainly hard to get very soft materials with controlled elasticity. The, we, if we said, what's the rheology? Of the, well, the G prime to G double prime, the vi elastic to viscous component, is at least tenfold uh, more elastic than viscous for all of the gels that, that I show you results for here. And in other materials, you know, one has to be very careful about uh, going through the, 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 really the polymer chemistry and physics uh, and, and checking all these things. So, um, uh, so I've touched, you know, so far emphasized uh, uh, cardiomyocytes and the response to elasticity and giving a little bit of data with stem cells. I'm going to give you much more data on stem cells and then uh, in 2D, 3D, and then come back to some, some profiling uh, integrated with the stem cells. But this is a, just a bit of data. Uh, over the last decade, people have, have used these gels uh, in, uh, with various committed cell types. So Paul Jammy, a colleague at Penn, looks at uh, neurogenesis uh, on uh, so soft gels uh, 10 years ago and saw that more branching would, would, would occur on gels that are soft like brain uh, and not on gels that are too kilopascal or rigid like glass. All right? So neurogenic, uh, neur neuronal branching is, is, a, is a nice thing to occur to, in a dish, right? You know, uh, as opposed to not. Uh, we, we had worked earlier with the skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle striation. Here's that sort of optimal curve again. Uh, skeletal muscle, it's multinucleated muscle uh, cells and, um, and too soft and you don't develop the striation uh, just as I showed you with cardiomyocytes and too stiff, either gels or glass. And you, again, you develop, you develop stress fibers as opposed to the striation. And Dave Mooney worked with not the acrylamide gels, but an alginate gel system he had developed, functionalized not with collagen, but with a tripeptide RGD and a cell line that makes um, um, uh, this osteogenic in character, an osteoblast. And, and, and it shows, well, he's got three data points. And I sort of, as you'll see from our data next, sort of a, 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 a maximum at 20 to 30 kilopascal. Okay, but he didn't actually have data on the minimum side, so uh, I, I, I sketched this in. But certainly, he's not getting 
He's getting a matrix elasticity effect, and he's not getting maximum bone formation from these cells, at least as, to the extent you'd say so in a dish, um, on a very stiff matrix. He's getting something close to what we said, what we've measured is, is, is similar to the protein layer on top of bone that it's pre-calcified be, be, before the, the, the collagen turns into uh, calcified, calcified collagen or bone. All right, so the stem cells that I had in the first slide and alluded to just now are cells that um, in very, for, for decades people have said can take on at least some of the lineage characteristics of, of these lineages I've told you about, you know, more readily bone than neurons, but there's a few handful of reports that say these MSCs that one can isolate from all human bone marrow, so, although more and more rarely with, uh, with age, uh, they become more rare, uh, but uh, these, uh, these adult uh, stem cells uh, can take on cer certain characteristics of neurons or muscle or, 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 or certainly um, uh, uh, bone-like cells. All right. the, the ability of these cells then to respond to matrix you know, is what we're testing here, all in the same serum condition. Again, collagen 1. It's not best for maybe all these lineages. I mean, we've done work with fat, I'll allude to, where we switch to fibronectin. Collagen is, is not the optimal ligand all the time. But the, but the elasticity is, you know, the same sort of systems we're controlling. And, and, and blebostatin, if you add this drug into inhibit myosin, this is, is, it limits the ability of these cells to sense the microenvironment and start turning on um, days after ch changing morphologies, turning on markers for neurogenesis, myogenesis, osteogenesis that we see here. So this is four or five days. And you need a sort of three, four, five days uh, to, to turn on a neuronal program on soft brain-like gel, not seen on stiff gels, uh, muscle uh, marker, this is a muscle transcription factors, a trans transcription factor on the intermediate stiffness gel, not on the soft, not on the stiff, likewise for, for the bone, right? So, so these cells are uh, assembling cytoskeleton from disassembled to more and more assembled stress fibers uh, uh, with uh, stiffness of the matrix, and then mo many people that work on cytoskeleton will say, okay, I look at a disorganized cytoskeleton, I'm not going to see many adhesions engaging the matrix, so that's what we stained for here, and in fact, that's the case. This, the adhesions engaging the collagen on the gels show the same sort of trends. We worked with uh, our colleagues, again, that uh, did the theory for the striation organization to, to, to understand uh, cytoskeletal assembly and polarization, organization in this case of just actinomycin that doesn't striate. And so the theory papers here uh, for the, the active force relative to, the, to the, the passive mechanics, the active mechanics versus the passive mechanics of these cells. A, a key parameter here is the polarizability of these cells, uh, how, how elongated they'll become and and uh, it, it both, uh, really, with respect to the cytoskeleton, the, the alignment and elongation. And the, the forms are very similar to what I showed you for the, for the striation. I, I didn't mention it, but it's really a Lorentzian uh, uh, type of function uh, here as well as for the striation. In this case, it's, it's for the order parameter, the organization alignment of the actin cytoskeleton as a function of matrix elasticity. The theory, the dashed lines here going through the, the, the experimental points, the, the R parameter here that breaks this up into three groups of really cell is highly elongated cells or uh, um, uh, less elongated cells. So we sort of had to take care of boundary conditions. So anyways, the details have been published a few years ago, now, a couple years ago now. And, 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 and the point is, you know, that here's theory again. And I said this, you know, slide number two. You know, polymer, polymer science is more than just chemistry and, of course, biochemistry, which is really accounting. But, but you, ha you want to have uh, theorists contributing and modeling to, to help guide, you know, how, how are these things responding? Okay, so, so that kind of data and what we had already anticipated said uh, myosin 2 should be important, should be critical. I alluded to it. So here's the sort of experiment with this drug. Um, in inhibiting myosin 2 uh, blocks all the gene expression. This is, this is, these are neurogenic genes that are being turned on in a soft matrix. These, these genes are myogenic genes. The one I mentioned, the uh, myoD, is a transcription factor. It's, it's low on soft. It goes up on stiff, uh, 11 kilopascal, and comes back down on rigid matrix, bone-like matrix. So there's myoD in, at the mRNA level at seven days, showing the same trend as the protein. Um, unless we inhibit with, with blebostatin, unless we inhibit with drug, 
then this thing is, is suppressed. So the cells have to use that myosin to spread and, and, and pull on the matrix, like those cardiomyocytes, and then use that to somehow turn on pathways. And I'll allude to some of those uh, some, uh, later. All right, you can model this data in very simple terms. Again, you sort of get something Lorentzian in form. We have uh, stress and mechanics multiplying together, really coming from two terms of a, of a, of a, of a fr uh, free energy, active, free, effective free energy for the system. So the probability of some kind of response here was, was modeled for the, da the data, the neurogenesis, myogenesis, osteogenesis here for these stem cells. The gray curve is if we add, um, if we add myosin inhibitor, we basically block all of this, right? And the parameters that fall out of that kind of modeling are useful. They tell us things like, the, the effective temperature of these cells that are do, gen, generating all this activity, the, the effective adhesion and cooperativity and adhesion, all of these parameters increase with, with uh, rigidity of the matrix. Cells are more quiescent, less adherent from the, from the modeling parameters on soft materials uh, like this. Okay, so uh, this lends a little bit of insight into disease, I think, because MSCs have been occasionally used in, in the context of of therapies where there's fibrotic scars, and people have sometimes noticed, not everyone, that um, there's calcification that occurs. And, and uh, so that, that so, so kind of makes sense. We, we've measured, I've showed you some AFM results for the infarcted heart, a fibrotic heart, and uh, that aligns with the mechanics of osteogenesis, aligns with uh, David Mooney's data for RGD alginate. His, his data is really not here, but it would be this, this part of the orange curve here. So I think we have a better understanding. Osteogenesis doesn't occur on rigid materials. It occurs at intermediate stiff, but intermediate stiffness materials. Um, but this is also uh, pro-osteogenic in a, in, a, in, a, in a scar. And so, as I said, people that put MSCs uh, in, a, in scars sometimes have reported calcifications, and that, that sort of matches this data. Others have made use of this data uh, in, in, in stem cell therapies. This is a stem cell group from, uh, from Stanford. And what they did was, was uh, isolate muscle stem cells, not these mesenchymal, but muscle stem cells, grow them on gels that are too soft or, 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 or muscle-like or too stiff, and show that uh, if, we gr if they grow these cells on muscle mimetic gels, uh, the best myogenesis occurs in the animal. Um, with, with, with cells that are grown on the right gels, right? So matching the, the mechanics of the, of, of the target tissue, priming your stem cells uh, in these, micro, these soft, compliant microenvironments uh, seems, seems a good idea. Okay, so I was asked, and I said this was coming earlier. Anyways, this is the, the 3D. And so the, the, the hyaluronic acid allows us to polymerize a gel on top. All right, and that you know that's of course not just a cell culture question. Cells really are surrounded by matrix and other cells. So, so can we can we get these kinds of responses uh, in, in with 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 an overlay of hyaluronic acid? So this paper came out in the last few months, uh, years in the years in the making. This is one of these MSCs on top of what might be I don't know acrylamide gel below, but hyaluronic acid gel above. Right. So so here's. Here's the cross section of that. The green is the collagen one functionalized on the acrylamide. So the adhesion density we, we measured on the top of this cell, and that's shown here, okay, with the, the overlay or without the overlay. And basically, the, with, with the overlay, the amount of adhesions, the vinculin or paxil, adhesions engaging the matrix on top, this is a symmetric gel, is pretty much the same as the gel as the uh, adhesions below. In fact, this was slightly softer, so I think this is slightly lower than, than the underlying gel. But clearly, there's fewer adhesions on the top of a, gel, of a cell that doesn't have an overlay of matrix, all right? And then these other questions, okay, if it's soft below and stiff above, or stiff below and soft above, what, what happens? And it's exact, this cell can't tell up from down, all right? It engages, and that's with the morphology and cytoskeleton data. Uh, here's the morphology, and I'll show you the cytoskeleton. Um, so here we, we add the overlay after 24 hours, and, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, I guess this is the really key. This is the aspect ratio of the cell. This is the soft below and stiff above. This is the stiff below and soft above, and those, those two data points are basically the same. If we have stiff, above, stiff below and stiff above, you have a cell that's more needle shaped, it, it looks different. And then the cytoskeleton looks different, and, and statistically it's, it's very different. The soft below and soft above is, is sort of the, you know, the softest case, of course, and is different from the, uh, from the others, right? So uh, 
at least with these overlay kind of cultures, it's 3D, it may not be you know, throwing cells in a matrix, being surrounded, and I'll get to that next, but, um, but this is engaging all around and is, and is basically showing matrix elasticity matters. It does modulate morphology and cytoskeleton as I'll show you next, and that's here. So here we look at the organization of the cytoskeleton, the order that emerges as a function of matrix elasticity, here it is, all right? This is that same sort of Lorentzian form. So here's, the, here's at least that upward part. Uh, and now when we add the, th the 3D overlay, so those white data points are basically those three points. And then these black data points, we add the overlay. So we have soft above or stiff above. Uh, and, uh, and it's modulating the, the, the order of the cytoskeleton, but actually in ways that fit the theory because the, cells, the cell shape is changing. And if the boundary uh, of the cell, the shape changes, then uh, say it becomes more needle shaped, then the cytoskeleton filaments within tend to become more ordered and aligned. And that's, uh, that's the tendency here, right? The results here there, I would say, are largely understandable. And, and 3D is not that different from 2D. But it is different from 3D symmetric, from taking cells and just pouring them in a gel and having a cell surrounded completely by, by, by gel. This is a semi-degradable gel. It's not, we're not, not intended to be degradable. But, uh, but there is a signature that does, does look the same. These cells are more spherical than uh, needle-shaped or spread. Uh, they, uh, they have more actin cytoskeleton at the, at the cortex. Okay, these aren't, these aren't polar, polarized. They have more actin cytoskeleton at the cortex for a stiff matrix than a soft matrix. That's what's, what's most clear here. Right? But we, our theory tells us if we constrain the shape, you're not going to get alignment of the, of the cytoskeleton. This is just, you're not going to build big stress fibers that are all aligned. Uh, you're going to have isotropy, but you do see a, a cortical segregation here. So there is sensing of the elasticity even when you do it in sort of what many people say is the more conventional 3D symmetric, as we call it. All right, so what are the mechanisms? So this is the last couple minutes, I hope, of matrix sensing. And, uh, okay, so we go from, I, you know, I, I had one other slide just to remind you, you know, with, with the brain and the, the, the brain tumor and the flank tumor, and, you know, that's 3D also. And we could make a bit of sense of that, right? But, but we, we, as, we, as we were doing those studies, we said, let's just generalize and just do proteomics on all tissues. And look, look, is there any systematics? There's a question, yeah? Yeah, so in the previous example, we showed yeah. uh, with the yeah, 3D uh, example. So is the porosity of the hydrogel uh, on the uh, when you have a softer gel, then is the gel more porous, and would that affect the not the density of uh, adhesion points of for the cells, and whether that would affect? Yeah, the I, I can t I can tell you in in two D, the the stuff that that we did that we did here was was all in the limit. Let's see, I had it, I had it way back where you're not ligand limited. All right, so we knew that spreading. Um, I had this back here. We knew that spreading, yeah. So this, this, I, I, this is cell spreading, and this is ligand density. So we, we, mo everything else we, I've shown you really is in this, this ligand unlimited regime. All right. So we know in 2D the answer is no. It's harder to show that. So, so with the 3D gels, right? We were working in this regime where 2D is is, is no problem. All right. But um, it's harder. You know, cells all look uh, spherical. Uh, in, in, in these 3D symmetric cultures. So I don't have a good readout that I, that I have in, in 2D, yeah? But, I, you know, we, 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 we added enough ligand in, in all those cases. Por porosity is different, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, you, you, it would be nice. Um, porosity of the HA, I have to say, the a porosity of the HA gels is also different from the porosity of the PA gels. And so things I show you with overlays, I, 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 you know, I, I feel comfortable that this doesn't matter because we can have a PA gel of 1 kilopascal below um, or 11 kilopascal below and then HA of 1 and 11. And I told you it's all the same. And these have fundamentally different porosities uh, because the, the density of the polymer being polyanionic and the nature of the crosslink. So porosity doesn't matter for the overlay. I'm pretty, I, I feel comfortable in saying, but I, I can't do that. I can only do hyaluronic acid here. Other people are working with PEG, and that's where you'd sort of say, okay, we'll compare different hydrogels of the same elasticity and see whether you get the same profile for, you know, two, three, a hundred different hydrogels, right? And that, that, that's a good experiment yet to be done. 
but we've sort of done that for the 2D and also the overlays, right? But that's, that's you know, to, to, to really say that this response is elasticity rather than porosity, rather than ligand, I should show you, you know, at least two and, and you know, arguably even more, right? And that's where the field is. Some are playing with PDMS and saying some different things than others who play with other gels, right? And, and you know, more, more groups have to make more polymers and, and look for the unifying factors. So far, in 2D and also in 3D overlays, um, with, a, with a couple of polymers we've engineered well, I, I say you, elasticity is the common denominator. Yeah? So if you have a stem cells in your situation, how yeah. will it differentiate into Will it be a new run or a yeah, we, yeah, we didn't go take it that far. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it sounds, yeah, the postdoc was finishing and we just took it this far. Yeah, uh, yeah. Another question, how deep can it sense softness? I mean, how deep? How, yeah, deep in how deep, yeah, that's a whole nother talk, right? So, but we've, we, we published a little bit on that. In fact, our cell paper had a little bit of it. And basically, it, the, the softer it is, the, the, the further it can feed, but it's, it's microns. And so the stiffer it is, it's like uh, tens to hundreds of nanometers. Okay? And we've done finite element models, and I can give you some of the references if you. Yeah. But we have more work going on, in, actually, in the context of what I'll tell you next, but I, I don't have any of the slides to show you. Any questions from this side? I'm not looking over here so much. No? Roger, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're going to get that at this, but what about the nature of the in 2D, 2D with the overlay and yeah, okay, so, so we, we, we only looked at, at, at um, vinculin area per cell area, okay, in the overlay, in, in the overlay. We didn't even uh, try to stain in this 3D symmetric, okay? But this, you know, uh, this, this overlay, there's, other than the, the artifact of the confocal section, right? We, we have a first gel that the cell's on top of. It's obviously optically flat. Then you have this other. So within, within that optical section, you know, it, it, looked, this, it looked similar. It looks similar. I mean, de density, yeah, density. Sort of punctate. Punctate, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe you can see better in the paper, you know, you even see stress fiber alignment into the focal adhesions. And that's my next question, the arrangement was... In this kit, yeah, uh, we didn't show enough pictures of this, but, uh, but uh, you know, if you have a cell that's more, that's more, has, has more broken symmetry, more elongated, you know, you'll see more elongated focal adhesions, right? And in this case, the example shown here is more... Huh? And more stress fibers. Yeah, and more stress more, more st more stress fibers, yeah, it's, uh, stress fibers go up with stiffness. It's the alignment that uh, is, is affected by shape, cell shape, right? And cell shape, but also shell, cell shape is affected by elasticity, so, yeah. If the cells does not like the softness, can it emit some ECF to change the environment? So th that's, you know, that, that's sort of what, uh, I, I, you know, I remind you we show in the tissue, right? That mouse tissue, right? So. So I think we, we put the, those glioblastoma cells, right, in the, um, I know you're probably asking in culture, right? Uh, so, so the, uh, when we've done, we've, we've got more, more work to do like this, but, but this, um, this, this profiling down here is, is the kind of thing you, you want to do with cells in culture as well. Now the hydrogels, don't absorb, and I, I gave you one bit of data on this, you pre-incubate you, you pre gels with serum, which has vitronectrin and fibronectrin and other factors, and it, the, the gels pre-incubated with serum uh, or not, the se uh, a subsequent culturing of the cells, the, look, the cells look the same, okay? So, so 24 hours in serum has no effect, right? So it's contributing to matrix, even though, you know, the other mouse cells are contributing much more to matrix, 21 to, you know, 21 to 1, 24 to 1, uh, in between those two, those two uh, tumor sites in vivo. So yeah, those, those, those things can happen. And I would say, you know, it's sensible to at least think about this relating to, 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 uh, to rigidity, right? The more matrix you have, the stiffer it'll tend to be. And that's what this, uh, this data says, right? And I can show you the other, this was collagen 1. I can show you collagen 6 and call it all the other collagens that we get, right? Instead, I'm going to show you a nuclear protein, all right? So, so we take the same mouse tissues, right? Just to try to finish up in the next few minutes, we take the same mouse tissues that I've told you about and we profile uh, 
the nuclei. All right, so we, now we do mass spectrometry of, adult, of nuclei from adult tissues. This is no, we're not putting human xenografts in, just normal adult tissues from brain, liver, fat, lung, muscle, heart, cartilage, bone, and of the hundred, more than 100 quantified proteins from nuclei among all these tissues, here's protein X. I can't tell you because the postdoc has worked for years on this, so we just have to get this paper. Protein X doesn't matter. It's a nuclear rheostat for tissue elasticity is what, I, what, we, what we conclude. It's, it's, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the, it's really a, a controlling factor as well. It's scaling, typical of polymer physics here, uh, with elasticity, you know, not to the first power, but a fractional, a fractal power, 0.7, all right? The black points are, are mouse uh, primary tissue, right? There's some scatter, but the R squared is, you know, almost 0.9, it's okay. Um, the, uh, the red points are various cell lines, uh, cell, uh, primary cells and cell lines. The MSCs um, are up here. The x-axis, of course, I should have emphasized, is, is the elasticity. The, the, we put MSCs as, as being uh, sort of stiff on a tissue microelasticity scale. As I alluded to, they tend, they tend to make bo bone better than any other, any other lineage. So he said, okay, this is a bone-making cell more than anything else. But they can make other, other lineages with the right cocktails. Uh, this is a C2 C, this is a muscle, a mouse muscle cell line. This is a human lung um, cell line. It's fitting on the black curve. This is, a, this is the glioblastoma uh, cell line, brain derived. This is um, human blood cells, marrow derived. Ma blood marrow, uh, bone marrow, right? Bone marrow is very soft and flexible, right? This is what first thing Wikipedia says. Bone marrow, flexible material in your bone, right? That's, these cells live in soft like, like brain, in fact, and we've, we've measured this. It's a, few, it's, a, it's a 300 pascal or so, some noise. But. So, so even cell lines that have been propagated for decades on plastic have protein X at the level that reflected the original tissue. It's remarkable. It's not just primary fresh tissue. There is some responsiveness and some importance to it. I'll show you next. Moreover, as we go uh, uh, up in stiffness, We've characterized nuclei from these cells and these cells and, well, all the cell lines, and the nuclear stiffness goes up, right? Calib validated with West. So, so, in fact, this, this, this protein ties into nuclear stiffness. I'll not say more about that, but this is a protein that changes with stiffness. This is a protein that affects cell fate of these MSCs. If we, um, if we overexpress it, if we knock it down, we can shift from um, stiff matrix that pushes bone formation as opposed to soft matrix, the light blue that, that um, uh, is, um, is limiting bone formation on this side to stiff matrix that uh, suppresses fat formation to soft matrix, the light blue, that promotes so uh, fat formation, in this case over expressing protein X, in this case knocking it down, right? In this case, tracking what happens to the endogenous protein X if we don't, if we don't do anything. So this is a protein that senses the microenvironment. This is a, a protein that influences cell, cell fate, uh, bone, bone and fat. All right. So finally, to the end, uh, flexibility offers opportunities, right? I, I, I wanted to talk a bit about this, this, you know, this uh, drug delivery sort of thing because I, I, it, it ties into the broader efforts of the lab, you know, and also flexibility is there in nature, right? And can be, if understood, exploited, you know, and, 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 and go through that, that crank, that cycle. So here, I, just to remind you, right, we, we show we can enhance drug delivery even for brain tumors, at least when we couple to radiation therapy. That tie, led us to stories about softness of brain, flexibility of, of matrix, which is very systematic, even in 3D, as I discussed, influences lineage, at least in 2D so far. And then finally, there's some mechanosensitive rheostat at least one, and we think there's not that many, that are, its level of the protein the scales really with tissue rigidity, proportional to almost, strongly impacts uh, stem cell programs. So this is uh, some, of the, some of the people that have done the work, some of the names have appeared on the slides. Uh, Stephanie uh, is, uh, is, is responsible for the latest work in heart, and, and Joe for the mass spec that you've seen throughout, um, and uh, Takamasa. <coughs> Uh, for the, uh, some of the drug delivery things together with the people on this side that really are the professional drug delivery guys. And then I should mention the, the, a key former student in the lab, lab Adam, Adam Engler, who's now faculty at, at UCSD, and key collaborators in at least the most recent work, uh, Lee, Lee Sweeney, who work in the stem cells, and, um, and, and Sam Safran and some of, the, some of the theory, Dave Spiker in the proteomics. Okay, so 
Good. There were questions along the way. If there are any additional questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit of a ways back, but when you're using the radiation therapy to allow the problem in my cell to the f yeah, the f right. get into the brain, does that open up that, an avenue for other things that may not be good or like in as well? We, 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 we know that the brains are shrinking, but i um, um, trying to think if we... Yeah. Uh, so, so, so many serum proteins get in. So immunoglobulin to albumin. Uh, and so in, lakiness is generally enhanced. You know, uh, have we done enough control? These, were, these, these are, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's not, it's not lethal to the mice and um, in, in and of itself. And coupling it to the chemotherapy seems to have, only have advantages. Yeah, please. For protein X, do you have any uh, hypothesis for the mechanism it's using? Or is that cascade? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I have to realize, I'm not just speaking to you. I, I guess this is the World Wide Web, right? So, yeah, we have, we have some insights into the mechanism, yeah. Yeah. Uh, correlation with side, yeah, it's, uh, we have correlations with, with biophysical properties, yeah, of, of, of the nucleus, yeah. And um, of the nucleus, and, and, and in fact, it feeds back into the cytoskeleton and some of the components I mentioned along the way, yeah. Yeah, and it, and it appears actually in the, in the brain tumor story, too. So I, we see it as a very promising uh, mechanosensitive marker, you know, in disease as well as developmental context. This is a fascinating marker in development too, right? Yeah. It would seem to me that the, uh, to the extent that that matrix or cytoskeletal stiffness is associated with tension, that's probably reflected in the nucleus as well. So yeah. You retain this sort of factor ten difference in stiffness as the cells become stiffer in different matrices. Yeah, yeah, it's it's blunted, but there's something there, right? It's it's it, it is a it's it, and you see it in the scaling of that of protein X, right? But it's it's, it's there's a, there's a hallmark of that, right? Propagating from the from the matrix, the tissue, in, into the nucleus structurally, right? Yeah. Either I know it was a long, a long, a long class, right? Long lecture. Thanks for your patience. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks.